Well, it has been said that everyone is seeking something. Now, whether that's 100% true or not, I have no idea. But I get the gist of what's being said when somebody says that. You, you get the gist of what's being said, right? Right? Okay, good. Just make it, okay. Am I, am I the only one who gets the gist of that? Just take a quick glance at society and you will see people seeking things everywhere you look. So for example, what do young people like to seek? They like adventure. Yeah, because when you're young, you have the energy, the curiosity, and the flexibility that the rest of us don't have. Amen? If you're young in here, be adventurous because you won't be able to do it forever, right? Has anyone, I've asked this of the other services, and surprisingly, the number was very low. It was actually two, two people in each of the first two services. Has anybody ever backpacked across Europe or some other country when they were younger? Has anybody done that? We got one here, two, three, four. Okay, okay, this service, I knew it. This service, <laughs> way more. You're twice as, we had four in this service, twice as adventurous as everyone, all those other services. True story, I have a good friend, uh, friends that go to church here, Jamie and Susie, and Jamie, when he was younger, backpacked across Europe, and he was standing on a corner in Germany uh, where he met Susie, and they got to talking, and um, she invited him to come hang out with some friends that night, and he did. They got married, and they, they're at our church, and it's just an awesome, one of those awesome stories. Isn't that cool? Very, very cool that you would meet your bride on a corner in Germany as you backpack through. Just truly incredible. Now, after people are, you know, when you're young, you're adventurous, then you grow up and you get married and you seek to have kids. You seek to establish a family, right? That's what a lot of people do. And of course, what you're really seeking during this phase of your life is what? Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> oh my goodness. Who remembers the days? You love the kids. It's the best of days, but you're just like, you're running on empty. You need sleep badly. But then you get older. See, as you get older, your priorities change and you, you seek different things at different times in your life. When you become middle-aged, such as myself, and I know many of you are thinking, Bill, you're in your late 20s, early 30s at best. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not supposed to be that funny. <laughs> when you're, you're middle-aged, such as I am, um, you know what you're seeking after, right? You're seeking to look as young as possible for as long as possible. <laughs> Do I hear an Amen. For those of you that are middle-aged like me, right? And then, of course, you retire. You get older, you retire, and what you're seeking at that time in your life is totally different from all the others. And you know what you're seeking when you retire? Yeah, you're seeking to be left alone. <laughs> Leave me alone. Anybody in that phase? Amen. Yeah, all the, everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> totally. I kind of think I'm entering that phase a little bit, but not quite there totally yet. But it raises the question this morning, if I could ask you a question, for those of you that are online or those of you that are here, what is it that you're seeking? What is it that you're seeking? If everybody's seeking something, what is it that you're seeking? It's a question we'd all do well to ponder. Why? Because life is too short and there's too much at stake not to be seeking what truly matters. Life is just incredibly short. There's actually a fascinating passage in the Bible where Jesus asks this very question to two of John the Baptist's disciples. He looks at them straight in the face and he says, what is it you're seeking? Let me read it to you. Here's how it goes. John chapter one. The next day, again, John, that is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So in this passage, Jesus is walking along, minding his own business, when John the Baptist, two of them, his disciples, just get up and start following Jesus. At which point, I think Jesus did what any of us would do. If two people started following you, what would you do? You might turn to them, well, at least Jesus did, and he said, what are you seeking? What is it that you want? Why are you, why are you coming after me? Basically, Jesus is telling these guys, state your intentions. What is it that you want? Which made it an ideal time for them to say something along the lines of, well, we are disciples of John the Baptist, and he just said that you're the Lamb of God, so we kind of want to find out who you are. Are you the Messiah? But what's really weird, and just tell me if this is not weird, what's really weird 
is what they, what they actually did. What they actually did is right here. And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Is it just me or is that a really crazy response? <laughs> it's like, hey, wherever it is, we can get you a better deal. We know Jerusalem like better than anybody. We all have friends like that. They can always get you the better deal. Maybe they were just better deal people and they wanted to find Jesus a better deal. But um, if I were Jesus, now be honest. I don't want any self-righteousness in here because no one else in the other services raised their hand. If I asked a question, what is it that you're seeking? And you responded by saying, well, where are you staying? I would, you know how I would respond? I would respond by saying, just answer the question. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? Thank you. You're, you're, you're even more righteous than the other con- the other. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't put up with this. I'm like, what? Just answer the question. But maybe we need to cut these two guys some slack. When you think about it, maybe Jesus caught them off guard. We've all been caught off guard where somebody just asks us a question and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And oftentimes when that happens, you just blurt out the first thing that you, comes to your mind. And so maybe Jesus caught them off guard and they just blurted out, well, where, where are you staying? Or perhaps they weren't sure how to answer the question. It's kind of an intense question and sought to deflect. We don't want to answer that question, so I'm going to deflect and change the subject. After all, they're in the presence of Jesus. It can be a little bit intimidating. Or maybe, just maybe, the question the disciples ask Jesus very much reveals what it is they're seeking. You see, by asking Jesus where he was staying, they were revealing that they were seeking more than just a quick conversation with him. They wanted to spend time with him. They wanted to learn with him. They wanted to be taught by him. And it's not surprising, John just had just called him the Lamb of God. But you know what's interesting? In the days leading up to this encounter, John had been teaching his disciples a lot of things about Jesus. Let me give you a couple of examples. John said this about Jesus. The next day, this is, it says the next day, but it's actually the day before today. Does that make sense? Okay, just to make it extra confusing for everybody. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God. But then he adds this little sentence, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I would certainly like to spend some time with somebody that can get rid of my sins. Amen? Wouldn't you? I would. I'm like, who? wait, what? Uh, Yes, let me go talk to you. I have a big debt I need canceled. Would love to talk to him. But John didn't stop there. John the Baptist also said this. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Again, if I were one of John's disciples, my curiosity would be through the roof with hearing a statement like this. John, you're telling me, John, our rabbi, our teacher, as great as you are, you're saying somebody's even greater than you? I'd want to get to know that person. But that's only the half of it. John also said this about Jesus. This is he who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. John had said, I baptize you with water, But this guy, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Definitely want to spend time with that person. But then he even said this. I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. What John had been teaching his disciples leading up to this encounter is truly mind-blowing. So when John's disciples started following Jesus, they had good reason to follow him. They, they didn't just want a quick conversation with him. They were seeking to find out who in the world is this guy? Who is this guy that John the Baptist would say such things about him? So their question makes perfect sense. It was their way of humbly saying, Jesus, is it okay if we could join you? Is it okay? Are we welcome can we come and learn from you? And you want to know the best part of this whole encounter is how Jesus responds. Jesus responds by saying this. He said to them, come and you will see. Come and you'll see. See, Jesus recognizes in the question that they ask him that they genuinely desire to spend time with him. They want to learn from him. And so Jesus says, come and see, come and you will see. This was his way of saying, you are more than welcome. You are more than welcome to come and spend time with me, which highlights, folks, an incredibly important point. If you get nothing from what I say today, just get this. Jesus will never, ever say no to the one who is genuinely seeking him. He will never say no to the one who is genuinely seeking him. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how mad you might have messed up your life. Doesn't matter how much baggage you might have. Jesus will never say no to the one who is genuinely seeking him. You know, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible addresses this very issue. Jesus says this in John chapter six, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I love it. Under no circumstances will Jesus ever say, go away to the one who seeks to draw near. Which raises an important question. This question, what is it that you're seeking? What is it that you're seeking? You might be here today and you're not a Christian. What are you seeking? You might be here today and you are a Christian. Let me ask you, what is it that you're seeking? Has Jesus taken a back seat to what uh, you're truly seeking? As I stated earlier, this question, what are you seeking, is one that we should all be pondering because life is too short and there's too much at stake not to be seeking what truly matters. By the way, do you know, we know one of the disciples that was one of these two disciples of John because a little bit later it says who it was. One of them was named Andrew. And you know, Andrew goes and spends some time with Jesus. Jesus says, come and see. And Andrew's one of those disciples. He goes to see. And you know the very first thing Andrew does upon spending a little bit of time with Jesus, the very first thing he does is this. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. They spent a little bit of time with Jesus and they knew everything that John the Baptist was saying was true. This is the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. See, Andrew quickly discovered what you will discover upon seeking Jesus. You will find him to be the Messiah, the Christ the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and who can take away your sin as well. The Bible calls this the good news, the gospel. The gospel, you hear a Christian go, well, the gospel. Gospel simply means good news. And here's the good news. God, who is rich in mercy, sent his sinless and innocent son into the world to die on a cross for your sins and for mine. He took on the punishment that we deserved. And the good news gets only better. Jesus rose from the grave and is the risen Savior who now offers forgiveness of sins to anyone who will come to him. Anyone who will seek him with a repentant heart, if you'll turn to Jesus, know this, he will never cast you away. He will never say no. And you might be sitting there and going, no, he'll say no to me. I'll be the one person (laughs) that has done things that no one else has done. No, you're not. You can't out sin God's grace. That's the grace that we see in Christ. John 11, 25, Jesus said this. He was talking to a woman and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And in Romans, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Which again, raises the question today, the pressing question for all of us today. What is it that you're seeking? You. Not the person next to you, but you. What are you seeking in life? Folks, life is way too short and there's too much at stake to spend our days seeking after the wrong things. I want you to hear the testimony of a sister in Christ who attends church here. And um, a couple, about six weeks ago on a Saturday night service, we had a Saturday night service, We all went over to the gym to, we had pizza over there. And so we were all over there and I was sitting at the table. Her name is Jana. And I don't know what prompted her to say it, but she said, you haven't heard my whole story yet. And I said, no, I haven't. I'd love to hear it. And she began to tell it to to the people that were at the table. There was probably like five or six of us at the table. And I sat and listened to her story and my jaw hit the ground. I was like, oh my goodness, that is an incredible story. Um, Jana will be the first to tell you, she was seeking all the right things, but in all the wrong places love, acceptance, forgiveness, all of those things that she was seeking. She sought, in the first part of her life, she was seeking those things in the wrong place. But one day in her house, on her bathroom floor, she cried out to Jesus and he showed up in a powerful way. So listen to the story, the testimony of Jana. Hi, I'm Jana Gordon and I've been coming to Arizona Community Church since about 2020. And this is my story of how I came to Christ. 
I grew up in Washington State. My grandparents were churchgoers, and I would attend church with them periodically. My parents started going to church a little later in my teens, and I would go to church with them here and there as well. We didn't attend regularly, but we would go. And I knew Jesus but I never had a relationship with him. I went on to attend college and had several two to three year relationships with men. We were living together in all of them and there was a lot of trust issues. Basically, all of my relationships ended with them cheating on me. I felt like I was stuck in these patterns over and over again. Didn't think I'd ever find love. I didn't think I'd ever have children. In fact, I had found out that I was probably not able to conceive because I had a medical condition and I was devastated. And shortly after that, I met a woman who I would have a seven-year relationship with. Um, at the time, I was pretty vulnerable and I didn't feel worthy. And I honestly thought that this girl would never hurt me like a man did. So I went for it and we ended up buying a home together Several years into it, 2008, the crash happened. I lost my job, and so did she, and looked like we were gonna lose our home as well. So she took a job in the Border Patrol, and so we packed up and moved. And about a year after that, I found out that she had met someone else and was no longer in love with me. So here I was, devastated again. Felt like nobody would ever love me and my life had nothing. Like, I was a mess. I had no job, I had no money, I had no security, I had no love, and I didn't know what I was gonna do. I had to move back to Washington State and back into the home that we owned together. That home would later be foreclosed on, but at the time, I was just taking odd jobs here and there to make ends meet and painting houses helping people clean medical offices, anything I could do to survive. One day, I was going to meet my friends and I got a speeding ticket and it was in a school zone and I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford anything. I went home afterward and I had just seen the movie Eat, Pray, Love, which is by no means a Christian movie. But at the time, I remember she was calling out for God on the bathroom floor. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give this a shot. And so there I was in the middle of the day on my bathroom floor, crying out to God, just sobbing my eyes out, telling him that I would not be able to go on any longer, that I was suicidal. Please God, just show up, please. And I think it was the same day, within a few hours, I got a call from that officer. And he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but please, will you just meet me in the parking lot of the nearest grocery store? I would really like to exchange your ticket for a warning. And then I got a phone call from my parents and asked me to meet him for dinner. So I went to dinner and they told me that they had just purchased a home in Arizona. And if I wanted to start a new life, I could just pack up and go. So 30 days to the day, I was driving down to Phoenix with my dog and $500 in my pocket. And within one week, I had a job. And I had been looking for a job for years and I couldn't find one and here I, go to Phoenix and I found one within a week. A week later, I met my now husband through a work thing and we would go on our first date six months later. After God started opening all these doors, I went to ch back to church immediately and I knew that I needed him full time in my life. I also was involved in a small group and I learned a lot about how I can be forgiven. I started attending church near his home and he eventually asked if he could come to church with me and he did. And a few months later, we were sitting in church and he was just tears streaming down his face and I knew that he had changed, that something had changed and that he found Jesus. And we ended up getting baptized together and then finally got married. I think about all the things that I never thought I would have and God provided all of them. I got a wonderful husband, 
I got children, and now we're a grandparent to a beautiful one-year-old granddaughter. And my life is so blessed. I am overwhelmed. I remember as I dove into my faith walk, I learned quickly that people in the Bible were just like me. They were unworthy of love and salvation, but Jesus made a way. He made a way for everyone. I'm walking proof of that today. He turned something so broken into something so beautiful for His glory. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, and you don't know the miracles that He does for you, and you don't know the forgiveness that He gives you and the love that He gives you, please call out to Him because He opens the doors. It doesn't matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, it doesn't matter who you are or the baggage you have. If you'll turn to Christ, seek him with a humble heart, he will never turn you away. The, the lady, the dear lady that shared that story, her and her husband are right over here. Would you two stand, Jana and Brady, would you guys stand so that we can say thank you guys real quick? Where are they? Here they are right here. I asked her, I said, can I point you out? And she goes, just give the glory to Jesus. So all the glory to Jesus in that. Listen, if you're here today and you, you're like, I don't know what the next step is. The next step is very simple. You don't have to have all the other steps figured out. The next step always is this. Seek Jesus. Seek him. Trust in him. Run to him. Cling to him. And for you, for some of you, you might be, today might be the day you're just saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to, I'm, I'm open. And maybe that's as much as you can give God today. Great. Others of you, you might be in a place where you're like, no, I've been seeking and I know today's the day. I'm ready to cross that line. I'm going to put my faith in him. Praise God. Perhaps you're here today and you're a believer and yet you haven't been seeking him. You've put him on the back. Today's the day on the back burner. Today's the day to renew your faith and to say, today is the day that I'm going to seek him anew with a fresh heart. After this service, here's the deal. We're going to dismiss here in a second. After the service, um, I'll be up here. Tina and others will be up here. If you would like to talk or pray, we're here. We'd love to just do that for you. If you're like, well, I, I might want to talk to you a week from now or two weeks from now, you know where to find us. We're right here at this church. You can call and just say, hey, I was at that service. I want to talk to somebody. You know where to find us. But here's the deal. Life is too short and there's too much at stake for you and for me to be seeking all the wrong things, to be wasting our time seeking the, wrong, the right things in the wrong places. Let today be the day that you know that Christ is that next step. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come before you this day. And Lord, we pray. I pray for anyone in here today, Lord, that um, doesn't have the answers. Like Jana, she, they don't have the answers. They don't know what that next step is. Lord, I pray that today would be the day they know what that next step is, that they would turn to you and trust in you. And if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Christ or trusted in him, it's as simple as this in your heart. You don't have to even say it out loud. You just say, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me and receive me. That's all you have to do. Because the minute you do that, you become a child of God, fully forgiven, one of his. He'll figure out the next steps. He will make the way for you. You just trust him one day at a time. Lord, I pray for anyone in here that is already a Christian that today would be the day that if they need to renew in you, that they would, that they would begin to seek you today afresh and anew. God, thank you for Jana and her story. And Lord, we know that you're writing those type of stories every day, all around the world, and even here in this room. So Lord, anybody that needs hope today, that came here discouraged, life is tough, Lord, it really is. I pray that today that they would leave here filled with hope because you are a risen Savior who forgives us and loves us, and we are now your children. So we love you and we thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I asked Dave to come up here. We ended, we ended the Good Friday service by singing the doxology. If you don't know what that is, you're about to find out. Would you stand as we sing the doxology together? Let's sing. Praise God.
What is it that you're seeking? What is it that you're seeking?